Good afternoon, folks. Thank you very much. My name is Charles Thomas. I work here at UDW Books, and uh, we have the pleasure of having occasional book signings here, and we also really like to highlight local writers. And a prime example of that is we're featuring today Mr. Paul Brown, who has written this, written this significant book about James Benji which really fills a gap in what has been published about A.G. This is a book that deals with his life as a child and youth in Tennessee. Uh, it's just a treasure to read. Uh, uh, with the wishes of Paul, we want to keep this a bit informal today, so I'm not going to give a very long introduction. We want it to be participatory and discussion-like. So anytime anyone wants to add anything to it or have any questions, just feel free to, to chime in. And I'm going to ask uh, Paul with the first question. Paul, what uh, inspired you and led you to write this book? Yeah, um, well, some of you, some of you know. First of all, thank you, Charlie, and, and uh, everyone here at Union Avenue Books. Uh, it's it's great to sit in this space that, but a year ago, this this wasn't yet open, right? It's been how many months since this uh, this side of the store? About five months now. This was a kind of a retro furniture store in the craft shop. And they'd been here for several years and they uh, decided to go on to another venture. Mm -hmm. And so we took it over and uh, knocked the wall out here and made the arch and uh, expanded it for mainly the, what motivated us so we could have readings like these. We were trying to shoehorn it to the other space there. And we were doing okay, but it was a little bit difficult for to have readings uh, in the atmosphere that we wanted, plus customers were coming in, so this has been a great benefit for the folks. Yeah, it's, it's really neat to see. Kind of bucking the trend and, you know, seeing a, a great independent bookstore getting bigger uh, instead of shrinking, so this is, uh, it's really great to see. I appreciate the invitation to come here. Um, but as far as how I got interested in AG, I, uh, I hadn't really, really heard of AG uh, much until I read um, uh, an article Jack Milley wrote for the Metro Pulse around 2011, and it was about the, uh, the annual event known as the Crash Bash which was basically a little literary event at a, uh, a nondescript bar down on Clinton Highway at Emory Road, um, and which scholars had determined was about the site that James Agee's father died in a car crash pretty close to that spot in 1916. And um, so sometime in the late 90s, Jack Neely and Jack Renfro and some other uh, folks around town started meeting there every May 18th and um, kind of commemorating this car crash that kind of inspired a literary career. And uh, so I, I was reading the article and it, first of all, the local connection, the fact that, you know, this thing happened over 100 years ago, almost 100 years ago. And uh, the other thing that caught my eye about that was the date, because May 18th is my birthday. Um, so realizing that there is this connection on my birthday really made me curious to read James Agee's novel uh, that's based on that incident. And I did, it was moved, and really started from that point, I wanted to find out as much as I could about Agee's life, particularly his life here in Tennessee uh, before he moved up to New England. So that's, that's how I got started on it. Well, I think you've got some pretty close roots to this location, too, do you not? Yeah, and I think you were actually born over in the neighborhood, just a few blocks from here. Yeah, just uh, um, like like many of you in this room, probably I was born at Fort Sanders Hospital down on Clinch. And uh, it wasn't until after, of course, I started researching AG that I found out through, again, Jack Neely's writings, is that A.G. was born on Clinch Avenue also in his grandparents' house on the 1100 block. So uh, <clears throat> just another little local connection that, that really interested me in finding out more about James A.G. Mm -hmm. I see Knoxville's first poet laureate here, Richard Bruce R.B. Morris. And I believe Mr. Morris was actually born 
and Fort Sanders is way away on the other side. But it's, an, uh, it's been an interesting process because, uh, you know, I didn't intend to write a book. I was just interested in James A. Gina's life, um, mainly because I loved his novel so much. It, it really drew me in. Um, I don't think there's any other novel that has drawn me in so much emotionally. And to find out that it happened just just up the ridge there um, was fascinating. You know, like a lot of you, I like local history that you can, where you can go walk the same streets and pass by the same buildings and experience kind of the atmosphere that was written about in these works. And so that, that kind of uh, motivated my, my search. And a lot had been written about AG, but um, there were still a lot of gaps as far as questions that I had after reading the novel about what was his family like, were the events that he described, did they actually occur that way, or were they, they, were they completely fictional? Uh, where were the places where his family lived? Uh, not only his maternal grandparents, but his paternal grandparents up near Jacksboro. Um, those are the kind of questions that led me uh, on my search, and so it involved visiting a lot of libraries and uh, you know, city halls and and stuff like that to try to find some of these answers. So, no, this is uh, this is my first attempt at something like this, and um, I, I teach music out in Morgan County at Coalfield School, and um, I think it it really took me back to being a student. Um, and fortunately, it was a subject that I was very interested in. Uh, but when, when some of my students this past week said, oh, I saw you on, on the news, and, uh, and some of them were kind of surprised because I hadn't, I hadn't announced this project at school at all. So it seemed completely foreign to them to see me in this other context. But uh, I think one thing that I told them, though, about how it relates to, to them as students. I said, um, you know, this was something that I was interested in. No one asked me to do it. Um, and I had to become a student again and find out how to go about researching, finding these answers, but also then how to actually write a book, which I'd never done before. So uh, it involved probably some wasted time as far as not organizing things the way I should have up front and having to go back and fix some of my errors and um, it also involved finding out how to how to format things you know I hadn't done really that kind of writing before and so I told them I told my students at, at Coalfield I said I think this can be a learning a learning experience that I can pass on to you and say that no matter what you learn in school, um, when you get to the end of 12th grade and graduate, you know, those of you who go on to college and graduate from there, that, that doesn't have to be the end of your learning. You can learn about whatever you want to. Um, and really, if, if you have it in your mind and heart to pursue a subject academically, it doesn't matter if there's a degree attached to it, just go for it. You know, continue your learning for the rest of your life, and um, so I think that's uh, that's a little tip that I can pass along to them as far as how something like this relates to their life. So. Jeanette, how yes. did you organize your research? How did I? Twice. Uh, yeah. Well, I started out um, every place I would visit, whether it was a library or. Um, um, the McClung collection here downtown, going through microfilm or <coughs> vertical files or something. I would I would write out kind of my findings as like a journal, you know, just like a journal entry. This is what I found, and I would write out questions that I had about about what I found and things that I wish I had found, and maybe they're here. And so um, 
they, there are probably you know a handful of paragraphs throughout the book that I kind of pulled from that. Um, what I ended up having to do later is go back and um, write out footnote material, endnote material in the proper formats and and stuff. So I did end up doing quite a bit twice and probably had multiple running documents that were a little bit redundant. And so that that was kind of the thing that wasted time in some cases is that I was having to, to redo things that uh, a, a seasoned researcher would have done right the first time. But, uh, but, but again, it was kind of a, a self-educating <laughs> process for sure that was, that was useful. Yes, sir. What surprised you about Angie's childhood? Uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, um, a lot of it was kind of confirmed with things that I'd read about A.G. before, about him being in some cases a little bit of a loner, um, a precocious child who loved to read and everything. Um, I'm trying to think. I was, in some ways, I was actually surprised at how closely it, it matched what he presented in his novel, A Death in the Family. I mean, it, there, there were invented parts in that novel, invented scenes for sure, um, but a lot of it was quite close as far as what I found. Um, there was a scene um, in the book, yeah, there's a, you know, it had been written about before about how he encountered bullies on Highland Avenue and uh, the fact that they made fun of his name and they would make him sing these little songs and uh, he would innocently, innocently go along with it and um, not really realize until later that he was being made the butt of their jokes. Um, one thing that surprised me were some, uh, I went to the University of Texas, Austin, where uh, they have a, I would say an equally, equal sized, well maybe not. They, they have a large collection of aging materials, original manuscripts and his pencil script. And um, I was going through some notes that he was preparing for a death in the family. And of course, you know, writers can do that kind of thing and they don't have to be, even if the novel's autobiographical, what they write down, that's not a guarantee of it being based on fact, you know. But, um, Anyway, I was looking through these, but there were so many of his notes that were in the first person about this incident that happened on the corner, uh, which would be the corner of what's now Highland and James Agee Street uh, up there. And it was, it was not an episode that appears in his novel, but yet he had you know, at least a few pages with these kind of fragmentary notes scattered uh, across the pages. And And it seems to be an episode that kind of started with a neighborly little spat with this neighbor boy and Agee's parents having to take him over to have them apologize uh, next door. And, um, but it actually kind of, Agee seems to have tied in things about, you know, his, his father being very disappointed that A.G. or Rufus didn't fight, and he actually tried to teach him to fight, and you know, the next time Rufus was confronted at the corner, he was as much of a coward as ever, and you know, he, he wrote about his father, um, you know, getting very angry and, and spanking him or whatever, and then he would apologize and go out and buy him something as a, as a consolation. You know, it talks about him receiving an Indian suit, you know, maybe a feather and a, a vest or something, and and that suit gets ruined in another confrontation with the bullies, and uh, his father yells at him again and ends up buying him ice cream, and, and it's it's just um, a different side of the the family that you, that doesn't really come out in in the novel. Uh, that was one one particular thing that I found surprising a little bit. 
Now again, it, it required some interpretation because again, a lot of his notes were fragments, just little things, almost like stream of consciousness, where uh, he was just trying to get as much down on the page from his memory as he could. And some of it maybe mixed with his remembrances as well as things that he invented that he wanted to change about it and put into the novel. So, um, so again, I, I try to, I don't try to hard sell a lot of this stuff that maybe um, a previous biographer did as far as suggesting that it actually happened this way when he's using evidence from A.G.'s fiction. Um, I, I try to suggest things a lot, but I, I try not to present them as fact if I'm not 100% sure type of thing. Um, but uh, go, going back to A.G. being a little bit precocious, one of my favorite stories that I found, um, and, and it was only because I, I visited Vanderbilt University where they hold the papers of Father James Fly, who was A.G.'s mentor down at St. Andrew's School near Sewanee, and as well as having papers and writings, uh, they also have audio recordings, reel-to-reel uh, -reel tapes that Father Fly liked to record, and um, there's one from about 19, late 1962 where he actually interviewed Laura Wright, which was her, her remarried name, but A.G.'s, AG's mother. Uh, so you, it's fascinating to actually hear her voice. And uh, so she tells this story about uh, Rufus in school. And um, uh, so I'll just read a little part of a paragraph here. Um, so remembering his father, Rufus later wrote, I'd be starting school that fall before he died, which would have been the fall of 1915. However, school records show that Rufus began the previous year despite being too young. Students entering in the fall had to be six years old by December, but Rufus was barely five years old in December 1914. Apparently, when Luce, Laura registered Rufus for kindergarten that June, she falsified his, his age as five years and six months, making him a year older than he actually was. And that was something that was actually in the school records that Knox County, I mean, the uh, Knox County Archives keeps the school records. So. Um, but Laura had taught him kind of how to read before he even entered kindergarten. And she said, um, you know, Rufus already knew how to read, of course, before he got there. And they wished he didn't. It wasn't done according to Hoyle, you know. They said, now don't teach Emma, that's A.G.'s younger sister, don't teach Emma anything before she gets to us. Please don't teach her anything, not to read or to count or anything. <laughs> and, and Laura on the recording, she said, insufferable, just ridiculous. And Rufus was awfully smart, of course, and he was jumping ahead and everything all the time. Um, in fact, they had some neighbor kids. Uh, one of the boys next door was a little bit older, but was kind of behind in his grade level. He wasn't quite, he was um, a little bit even with Rufus in grade level. And um, so Rufus came home one day, and these are, this is Laura telling the story. There was a boy on the other side of us there on Highland. He was a little older than Rufus, but in the same grade. And Rufus came home one day and said, it was too bad about him, you know? He just can't learn. He just can't learn. And I said, well, that is too bad, but don't think any of the less of him for that. If he can't, he can't. But you can. You have been given a good mind, I think, and you're supposed to do all you can with it. And not to look down on anyone who can't, but do the best you can. Well, he got it. And he went and told the child, don't you feel bad because you can't learn? That's all right. I can, but you can't, but that's all right. And the little boy wouldn't play with him anymore for a long time. And Rufus said, I don't know why he's mad at me. And I said, well, I do. It's not so mad as it's hurt his feelings. And he said, well, I don't see why. I told him it was all right. And I said, well, it did hurt his feelings. It's too bad you did that. I never meant you to tell it to anybody. So Rufus kind of had these kind of innocent way of being the smartest kid in the class and, you know, not meaning, of course, to put anyone down or hurt their feelings, but he was, uh, 
I guess you could say socially awkward in a way, um, just not not quite knowing what to say in the right uh, situation. But anyway, that was one story that, that I got a kick out of. <laughs> so. I was curious about his experience in the, the boarding school at St. Andrews. What was the, the purpose of that school and what type of classmates did he have there? Well, it was, um, many of you know, it was, uh, it's called St. Andrews School for Mountain Boys. Now, nowadays, it's, uh, it's called St. Andrews Sewanee. And it's, it's now a co-ed school, um, I believe middle school up through high school. I don't know if they do younger than that. But um, uh, founded in the Episcopal faith. Um, but back in Agee's time, I think the school was founded in 1905. Um, and it was back then only for boys, and it was for poor mountain boys. I mean, very rural, very poor families who um, weren't getting the education that they needed. So it was really started as, as a mission in some ways to these um, uh, four families. So this was after after Agee's father died in 1916. Um, Laura started to, you know, he, he was obviously missing his father. He didn't have that fatherly presence in his life, and um, I think also she could tell that maybe because of the bullying, maybe because of other other factors, but you could tell that she wasn't thinking that he was being led maybe in the right direction spiritually. Um, although, you know, he was he was still attending St. John's Episcopal up here on Walnut. Um, but so anyway, in the summer of 1918, she took him down there to just vacation for the summer. And she took their, her little daughter Emma with them, and they stayed in this little house. And actually the the little cottage where they stayed is still on the campus. Uh, it's, and it's, I think, a treasure that people don't know about because it's, it's the only house that A.G. even lived in, even temporarily, that's still standing in Tennessee. Of course, Knoxville didn't hold on to the, the one that was here uh, up until 1962. But uh, So anyway, I hope they hold on to it. Uh, if not, maybe a group of us can haul it up here to Knoxville, but uh, but anyway, yeah, it's, um, so they, they had a great experience there up on the Cumberland Plateau, uh, the weather was a little more tolerable in the summer than it was in Knoxville, a little bit cleaner air, and um, so they returned the following summer, 1919, uh, vacation there, and by the end of the summer, Laura had decided to enroll him there as a student. And he ended up spending five academic years there at St. Andrew's School. Uh, that that first summer, that second summer they spent there is when they met Father James Harold Fly, who uh, was only starting his second year of teaching there, a uh, history professor. And um, so once once A.D. started attending school there, uh, that really led to a lifelong correspondence and mentorship, in a way, between Rufus or James and Father Fly. Um, and I think Laura, that may be one reason why Laura decided to send him there, because she could tell that this man was going to be a, a father figure to him that he had. Um, yes. Kelly, what was it to get UT Press's attention for you? Oh, it um, it wasn't as difficult as I thought. Now, I, I had written some things and submitted it, and uh, the acquisitions editor there said that they were, they were very interested in it, but it needed some work before they could send it out to peer review. So I, I took it back and, and did some work on it. But as far as interesting them in the topic, it didn't take much uh, much forcing at all because, you know, of course, they're they've in recent decades probably pub published the most on AG and they're at halfway through a 12 volume set of his of his works uh, scholarly editions and so it to me it fit it was natural it fit right in as well as the fact that UT Knoxville and their special collections has uh, a ton of AG's 
papers and, and materials in there. So, um, so it, I think I think they saw that it was a, would be a good fit. And uh, once once we got the manuscript, some things ironed out of that, they uh, they they were happy to accept it. So. Could you address um, uh, how much of the death in the family was organized after AG's passing? Uh, that's that's a good question too. Um, I don't know <clears throat> how how many of you have read the the original version of A Death in the Family. All right, pretty good numbers. So that that was um, published in 1957 won the Pulitzer the next year. Those of you who have read it have, have I'm sure, seen the editor's note in the front of the book that says, uh, and David McDowell was the, the friend and editor who published that. He, he said that basically, other than putting in Knoxville Summer of 19 as the preface, which A.G. hadn't intended, but he, I would have, I would have highly encouraged him to do so because it's such a beautiful piece. Uh, McDowell said, other than that, and a few little things here and there, you know, a few little chapters that I couldn't quite work into the chronology, he said, basically it's, it's as A.G. left it. Um, and that was basically the story for 50 years or so. Um, if you haven't seen Michael LaFaro's restoration that, that was published in 2007, um, uh, Michael LaFaro, who's a retired uh, English professor from UT, he um, he made a very compelling case that the version that McDowell published in 1957 was not really that close to what AG had in mind because uh, Mr. LaFaro found outlines that AG had done as well as like 10 new chapters that weren't in the original publication. And um, Whereas McDowell had to take a few chapters and put them as flashbacks in uh, all italics because they didn't really fit in in uh, any sort of chronology. Uh, this Michael LaFaro, he he basically has a completely new introduction. So Knoxville Summer of 19 is not the prologue that A.G. In, intended. It's actually a nightmare sequence of A.G basically carrying his father's beaten body through the streets of Knoxville back to the, the corner where they sat and talked on the way home from the movies. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a dramatic work. In some ways, the original is a lot more audience friendly because I'll have to admit, Knoxville Summer of 1915 is a beautiful piece and it draws you in emotionally, whereas some of the things about the, the new introduction uh, are a little bit repellent. I mean, it's it's not this idyllic scene that he's painting. It's it's really a nightmare. It may be literally his nightmare that, that he kind of transcribed. Um, but um, yeah, if any of you are interested to see a version of the novel that is probably as close as we're going to get to Ag's actual intention, uh, check out the the 2007. Publication. It's called A Death in the Family, A Restoration of the Author's Text, and it's edited by Michael LaFaro. It's, it's really interesting. It includes scenes like uh, that weren't in the original, like at Chilhowee Park. It includes scenes um, of the arrival of the, the Model T Ford, um, stuff like that. So it's, it's real fascinating. I've got a question about the Joe Howie Park scene that's in the uh, uh, restored version. Um, it has to do with his, uh, little Rufus's relationship with his dad that you were talking about. Uh, a chapter that wasn't in the original publication where they go to Joe Howie Park and he's with his mom and his dad. <coughs> And I guess Emma as well. But I'm not sure about that. But uh, they go there, and one of the not the barkers, but one of the the uh, figures working in the fair there kind of gives him a hard time mm -hmm. about something. And his dad is saying, 
something to him, you know, he's not willing to take that off the guy the way he's talking mm -hmm. to him, and his wife sort of chills him out a little bit, yeah. and they go home. But in the chapter, Rufus says he comes back the next day with his dad, just the two of them, and he goes back and finds that guy and has some words with him. Yeah. And says, I don't have my wife here now, you want to talk to me like that? Yeah. And kind of confronts him a little bit about it. Mm -hmm. And Rufus gets that in there, and I'm curious about if, if you recall uh, any documentation, any reference that uh, uh, would show that that actually happened, or if you just uh, put it together, or what? That's that's a good one. Uh, the, I found uh, things in his notes about uh, Jill Howie Park being possibly the place where he saw his first movies, because they showed movies outdoors in some cases before they had theaters here in downtown. Um, I didn't find in his, in his notes anything particular about that incident um, that, that um, gave evidence for it being real, like something with, with it in, in first person or something. Um, there's, there, there are a lot of scenes that I wonder about that, Harvey. Um, you know, are there notes out there or are there letters or um, or things that just haven't been uncovered that <clears throat> give evidence for the uh, them being autobiographical? Because I'm really curious about that. It seems authentic. I mean, it, it seems like <coughs> with his dad being kind of a, a volatile guy and his kind of having to be calmed down a little bit by his his uh, more proper wife. Um, you know, it seems like a thing that that would be natural for him to do, and uh, or a natural reaction for him. But I didn't find anything particular as far as evidence for it being being true. Um, but it's it's still a wonderful scene. And Joe Howard Park was a, such a major thing oh, yeah. to him in Knoxville at that time. Yeah, it was. I I, I recall also Joe Holly. He called it Chihali Park. Yeah. As a little boy. And there's that <laughs> fragment that he wrote about his fourth birthday. Yeah. That's in Fitzgerald's uh, collective prose. Mm -hmm. And he mentions Chihali Park there as well. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting that Chihali Park just in the past week has been in the news about uh, the community. Uh, getting together, seeing what can be done to bring more life into the place and, and kind of have it be a, a hot spot like it once was, you know. So I think it's, uh, AG would probably be pleased by that. Yes, sir. Oh, you mentioned in the book that uh, obviously he was very close to his father, yet when he wrote his novel, he was not that kind of his father's relatives. Did you know? Any reason is it just because from that point on being from his mother's family? Or? I think that that may that may be a big part of it. Um, so yeah, from what I read, Ag didn't have too much contact yet with his father's relatives up in Campbell County, Campbell County, um, after his father died. I'm sure they went on some visits here and there, but um, yeah, that's that's a good question because even in those of you who are familiar with Agee's poetry, he had one called Dedication, and then there's a part of it where he talks about, he, he lists his family members still living and his family members that have deceased. And among his living relatives, there's not, there, the only one of his father's living relatives that he mentioned in that was his grandmother, and he, he gave her the wrong name. Uh, you know his his father's mother, um, but he listed you know all his relatives on his mother's side. So, um, but yeah, those those people, the the Camel County relatives, especially the the undertaker, uh, who is his uncle Frank Ag, was not portrayed well at all. Um, I, I mentioned that a little bit in in the book. Uh, Laura says that that whole part about Frank coming into the funeral drunk and, and kind of bellowing and wailing and how it was all his fault and everything. Um, Laura said that, that her son overwrote that part, that it was not really that way. But 
she didn't say it was untrue. She just said it was a little bit, a little bit overdone. So, you know, it's it's hard to know. And you know, someone going back who, you know, all the none of those people are alive now. Um, it's it's tricky as someone writing about a family that I've never met. You want to be you want to be careful about what you write and say, you know. Give as much evidence as you can, one way or the other. But, uh, but ultimately, none of us were there. So, uh, so I, I, I could just go off what what AG wrote, and what some of the other family members wrote. Uh, so, yeah, that's a good question. Though he was definitely more and more um, influenced by the artistic, you know, socially involved side of you know his mother's family here in Knoxville. So. In my opinion, one of the coolest parts in terms of Knoxville being honored for its literary history is your documentation of the seemingly true story of Cormac McCarthy pursuing a few bricks before AG's house is torn down. Uh -huh. And for those who don't know, Cormac McCarthy lived in Knoxville for a time, attended Catholic high school, and has for a long time been a recluse, and spends most of his time with scientists, but he obviously was impacted by a death in the family for its literary power, as well as its local history. So what I'm wondering is, for a, an author such as McCarthy, who's so respected, what do you think a death in the family has that's not only a local power, but a transcendent literary power that would bring in the Pulitzer Prize and such prestige? Oh boy. That's a, that's a good question. I don't, know if, I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that. I, I can only say that, yeah. like, I'm, um, I haven't read enough McCarthy to, to um, to compare what I have read, you know, I've read Child of God, I've read Sutri. Yeah. Um, um, those aren't nostalgic books <laughs> at all. And I know nostalgia is not is is not uh, is often not the sign of good literature. Uh -huh. But uh, but Ag was such a good writer. He he used it. He he showed the the bad as well as the good. Yeah. But. Um, but his work doesn't have the hopelessness in some cases, uh, the they fatality of, of McCarthy's, Cormac McCarthy's works in some cases, in, in my opinion, as, as an unstudied uh, reader of McCarthy. Um, whereas, whereas Agee's, I mean, Agee struggled with depression. He struggled with alcoholism and, and you know, ultimately lived a short life. But his works are hopeful. Um, he did have his surrealist moments, um, his absurdist moments, but um, but ultimately you get to the end of a death in the family and you know, aside from some family arguments over religion and stuff like that, I mean it's still it's still a hopeful book. It's it's a really beautiful book. Um, um, I, I, I can read Sutri, and maybe it, it, it deserves a second read um, before I talk much about it, but um, uh, Sutri is amazing, and the, the, the language is brilliant and almost virtuosic. Yeah. I mean, but I don't come away with it saying that was a beautiful, that was a beautiful work that really touched me. Um, whereas AGI, I, I get that. A lot when I read his his writings, so um, that that may be the best way I can answer that. Oh yeah. Thank you. And just as a comment on the universality of, of uh, Agee's work in the death of the family, he's dealing with a theme that touches everybody, mm -hmm. you know. And so uh, that I think is why it has such broad appeal. Context is different, circumstances are different. But that's something. Everybody's going to deal with. And one of the techniques that Agee used effectively 
was he slowed certain parts of that novel down to real time. So it takes you the same length of the time to read it as this is happening, you know, them getting the news of the father's death, how they're dealing with it, all that's happening in this real time. And the, the you know, technique is just powerful. That's my take. Those do seem to be the two books yeah. of Knoxley. Yeah. Yeah. Some people, there, there are people who say that uh, Sutri has kind of taken the place of the death of the family as far as being Knoxville's book. Uh, I, don't, I don't hold that view, but there, there are people who do, and it's, it is a, a brilliant work. It's, it's thick. Yeah. Well, one thing that you mentioned LaFaro's restoration. And when you look at the themes in the Restoration, I mean, he called it a radically different book than the original publication. Yeah. And that A.G. actually, he suggests, had the book in far more of a finished form mm -hmm. than what McDowell led on in his uh, notes from the editor. Mm -hmm. But if you, just looking at it, uh, you mentioned the end of A Death in the Family, mm -hmm. which is the same in both the restoration yeah. and in the uh, original publication. Mm -hmm. And a couple of things occurred to me. I always have wondered about that ending, which uh, I think is such a brilliant uh, ending there with his uncle walking up to the old battlefield uh, in Fort Sanders. Mm -hmm. And his uncle, who was the artist of the family, mm -hmm telling him, you know, his uncle was like a non-believer and was really put off, I mean, in the story, mm -hmm. he was really put off by the uh, father who came into the picture to take over the services but wouldn't read the whole service over mm -hmm. uh, Rufus's dad because he wasn't a member of, of the church. Mm -hmm. And so he... The uncle really lays out the old battle between, you know, organized religion and just spirituality. Mm -hmm. And his uncle makes a case for Rufus's father being a far more spiritual person than the priest. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look at the restored version where he has that nightmare in the beginning where his father's John the Baptist and John the Baptist is murdered. Mm -hmm. You've got the, the beginning of that and the ending of that heavy religious symbolism, and then a little bit throughout mm -hmm. with uh, Father Jackson and so forth. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the restored version, A.G. makes that a far greater conflict in the overall story than the original publication. Mm -hmm. Strikes me. Yeah, and and. Uh... You know, Laura, um, I wish I'd have had more, seen more letters or something giving a, a deeper response of what she thought of, of the novel. But she, as far as the kind of conflict, the day of the funeral between Laura and, and Hugh, um, she said that there wasn't that division. And she she said that Hugh was kind of hurt over the portrayal that, um, you know, they were very unified the, the day of the funeral. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, you, you wonder how much AG might have done it for just dramatic art or, or something uh, as far as how, how much of that was an actual issue between Laura and her brother. Um, I wonder that myself. Yeah. Curious about, and this is going back a little bit, but it's a little gap about uh, his leaving at St. Andrews. Mm -hmm. Now, he came back to Knoxville for mm -hmm. was it a brief period of time, and then what uh, inspired him, or what circumstances led him to move on from Knoxville? 
Uh, well, he, uh, I guess it was in early, just after the first of the year, 1924, uh, his grandfather Tyler lived at the corner of what's now 12th and Clinch. Uh, there's a big apartment complex there now. Um, his grandfather Tyler was sick and apparently sick enough that uh, A.G.'s mother Laura and his, his younger sister Emma um, decided to leave St. Andrews and go back and live with uh, her parents. So um, I thought, and, and some of the earlier biographers thought too, that A.G. didn't finish that, that semester, um, that academic year at St. Andrews School, but instead enrolled in Knoxville High School partway through that spring semester. Um, but according to the, his student records at Knox County Archives, uh, he actually finished out that, that school year and didn't leave St. Andrews School till May of 1924. So, uh, so he wrote a journal entry around the time he was compiling notes for Let Us Now Praise Famous Men in which he, he goes, you know, writing about traveling through Chattanooga going down to the cotton fields of Alabama. But he, he mentioned a time when he was 12 years old and I think it was actually more like 14 because he mentions a movie coming out uh, that he stopped and saw a movie in Chattanooga and ended up going back for another viewing of the movie and went and saw another movie and basically wasted a whole day in Chattanooga when he should have been back at St. Andrews. Um, and, and I'm guessing that he was coming back to St. Andrews after he came back after his mother and him, uh, sister came back here. I'm guessing that he traveled with them and then returned by himself to St. Andrews School. Um, so he finished out that semester, um, came back to Knoxville. They lived again with his grandparents on Clinch Avenue and uh, attended Knoxville High School as a junior for, for that next academic year. Um, after that, his family moved. I think they first moved to Florida. Um, he spent the summer bicycling through Europe with Father Fly. And um, I think from there, the, the family moved to um, uh, Charleston, I believe, something like that. So, um, and then he ended up enrolling at Phillips Exeter Academy. Uh, and his, his stepfather, Father Wright, Father Erskine Wright, was, was kind of the one who, I mean, that was a very prestigious, still a very prestigious uh, prep school. Um, his, financially was helped out by his stepfather um, going up there, so. Um, and then, of course, after that, went to Harvard and then started at Fortune Magazine right out of Harvard, so. How does a music teacher turn into a writer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. It just it started out as a hobby, and I guess I guess I didn't have as I didn't have enough hobbies. <laughs> or something. And uh, my my wife and I didn't have a, a little two year old at the time either. So um, I I had I had time where I could go to libraries and and uh, look stuff up at a, at a whim. Him, and uh, so it was. It was just a personal interest, purely. And again, it wasn't my intention to write a book. Starting out, I was just curious about Ag's life, wanting to fill in some gaps. And uh, my wife Jessica, after a couple years of hoarding information, she said, "Maybe we should think about turning this into a book." So, and she's a she's a writer. She's a freelance writer. So she she was very encouraging and. Uh, edited some of the earliest drafts, and, and uh, I couldn't have done it without her. Yeah, I would add that Paul's also been a source for a new documentary that's about to come out on James Agee. It was filmed by a, a Swiss filmmaker this summer. His name's Richard Dindo. Several people in here contributed to it. Greg Cromwellkin, RV, West Morton. And uh, Paul was a source uh, for Mr. Dindo. That, uh, that. So, in the film as well, I guess. 
And so uh, thank you for you know, not only providing us with this book, but uh, laying the groundwork for a documentary as well. Oh, yes. Yeah. I got an email from Richard this morning. He says, thank you. And he says, you are correct. Oh, <laughs> that was nice. Uh, yeah, I, I hadn't heard of Richard's work, but he's done a lot of films since the early 70s. He's done films on uh, Rimbaud and uh, Che Guevara and, and a bunch of big figures. The, the Guevara film is probably the one he's most known for uh, worldwide, but he's been, he's, he's been wanting to come to Knoxville to make a film about AG seriously since the early 70s. For 40 years, he's been thinking about this, and it was just last year that uh, because I've been down to St. Andrew's School, um, the, the lady there who works in the administrative building had my contact information and gave, gave him my email. And so we got connected, and uh, he, he came up to Knoxville last spring to do some scouting work, and then he, he filmed it uh, in September. Yeah. And uh, Charlie's got, got a part in it, too, and uh, plays actually, it, it's, it's a very interesting documentary, and I hope you all get to see it. Uh, I'm, I'm very curious to see it. Um, but uh, Charlie plays the, the art, artist uncle, uh, so he's kind of representing Hugh Tyler in the film, and uh, it's but it's it's not a conventional documentary. It's like a kind of a a film within a documentary somehow. I don't I don't know, um, but I'm I'm very curious to to see the work, and I think uh, I think it's a good thing for Knoxville. So. I'm sorry. That's that's also a good question. Yeah, he he wants it to show at maybe a film festival here. Yeah, he's made thirty something documentaries, so he's got quite a bit of acumen at this. But it'll all be basically up to him. It's supposed to be finished next week, and my understanding is he's going to distribute it or enter it in different film festivals. You know, maybe Tribeca and New York. Hopefully it can, so I don't know if it'll get there. But um, that's from what he said. He wants to try to enter that some film festivals and then kind of see what kind of traction it is. You know, he's basically saying, you know, like this was a labor of love. I was going to do it no matter what. If it gets a lot of public traction, fine. If it don't, it's going to be there for you know educational institutions or aging professionals. So we just have to see. And it was from reading Death in the Family. So like your response to Death in the Family, Paul, he read it, came across it in, back in the 70s, and that started his desire to make fun of it. What Richard said in his email is it was a uncompromising documentary, and it may be hard for some to watch, is what he told me. <laughs> so we'll see. Anyone else? I'd like to say one more thing on behalf of Rufus, which I've never read in case anybody here hasn't read it, those who just purchased it. But one thing I'm really grateful for, it's a great, tremendous book, but not only in this book does Paul go back and do a lot more research than has ever been done before in any of the other biographies on, on Aji's family and on his early life, but he also gives uh, a new history, a more modern history of Knoxville in this book. He's got a whole thing about that's never been really talked much about regarding uh, A.G.'s legacy in Knoxville and how it started to change and how uh, A.G. was more embraced at a certain time. And those of us who have been around here a long time recall when nobody paid any attention, the city of Knoxville torn his house down, didn't really care much about it, had, you know, no real connection with him, and that gradually changed, and Paul, in his book, makes the case that that, in a sense, helped revive Knoxville, with the revival of James Agee, and he details a lot of the different events and things that built up in that, and I'm really grateful that you did that. That's all new for Knoxville. Thank you, Arthur. Okay, I really want to thank all of you for coming out.
this has one been, been one of my favorite events that we've had here. And uh, Paul will be available to talk and sign some books. So thank you very much. Let's give you a hand.